Hello, 欢迎来到 Mandarin Slang Guide (MSG), the Chinese learning podcast that tastes great and probably isn't all that bad for you. I'm Josh Hogan Davis, bringing you the words and perspectives that aren't in your textbook. I'm very excited today to be joined by a special guest, John Chu. Hi, John. Hey, Josh. How you doing? Very well. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for inviting me on the show. It is my pleasure. You see, John Ju is good at a lot of things: strategic communication, design, writing, web development. But the reason I know who John is, and the reason I'm excited to have him on the show, is that he's the host of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast. And what he's done with the podcast has taken a very dense, eight hundred thousand word historical novel with about a thousand characters in it, and done a Herculean job of turning it into a podcast that's delightful and engaging and educational and hilarious. Areas to listen to, and it's kind of hard to overstate the extent to which the Romance of the Three Kingdoms still influences modern Chinese language and culture. So on today's show, we'll be talking about some of the expressions and references that you might hear in your everyday life that come from this novel. But first, John, I really want to know what motivated you to take on the insane job of podcasting the entire. Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Yeah, sure.、Um, so back in 2013, my wife and I became new parents.、Mm -hmm. uh, so for that entire next year,、uh, we just had basically zero mental capacity to do anything really, you know, intellectually <laughs> stimulating. Yeah, I think、uh, the most intellectually challenging thing we did was just sit on the couch and watch、uh, reruns of.、Um, The mid '90s、uh, Hercules Legendary Journeys、uh, TV hey, show. I won't knock that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So,、uh, but then by 2014,、um, I had gotten to a point where、uh, you know I was starting to get some of that mental energy back, and you know starting to get a little restless, wanting to pursue something a little more intellectually challenging. So I started thinking about what projects I could take on, and I had always been interested in podcasting as a medium.、Uh, started listening to podcasts in the you know early mid. 2000s, back when it was really like a do-it-yourself kind of project, right? So I always been interested in that. So I thought about, hmm, maybe I can do a podcast. And then I start thinking about what can I do a podcast about? Just you know, given my background, so I grew up in China,、um, spent the first ten years of my life in China before I moved to the United States. So just given that background, you know, I thought, hmm, maybe I could do something about Chinese culture, and that helps increase, you know. American understanding of Chinese culture, but you know I'm not a historian. You know I'm not an expert in you know really anything. You know、um, <laughs> that makes two of us, I suppose. <laughs> yeah,、uh, I did grow up. You know, listening to、uh, you know these great stories. You know, like the Three Kingdoms and the Water Margin, reading them and listening to them on the radio, watching TV adaptations. So you know, just kind of being immersed in them. And so I thought, hmm, maybe I could. You know, tackle one of these novels, and you know, it, anyone who has ever you know picked up an English translation of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, in particular, you know, they would know that it's very dense. It's got a ton of names,、mm -hmm. people names, place names. You know, it reads like just a series of battles. You know,、mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard to get into if you're not、mm -hmm. familiar with the story and the characters going in. So、mm -hmm. I thought a podcast may be a good way to. Help people, you know, get into the story in a more approachable fashion. Yeah, that's absolutely one of the things that I loved about it. Because when I read it in English, I hadn't started learning Chinese yet, so all these pinyin names and place names they were impossible to keep straight. But I feel like even though I read it cover to cover. Many years ago, listening to you narrate it really helped me for the first time get really clear about who are these people, what are they doing, where are they, because it's nigh on impenetrable. What I really want to get into today is how is the Romance of the Three Kingdoms still shaping modern Chinese culture and modern Chinese language? So, why do you think that Romance of the Three Kingdoms is important for understanding Chinese culture? Well, I think you know, for one thing, its stories and characters are. So deeply ingrained in Chinese culture that you know, just in everyday conversation, you're going to hear you know references to those stories and characters. And then I, I've always thought that it's important to understand culture from the stories it tells about itself,、hmm. right? So I think the Romance of Three Kingdoms,、uh, in many ways, captures a lot of the values, things that I think the Chinese culture sees as important and kind of takes pride in. 
Yeah, I don't want to get heretical now, but so we have lots of references from the Bible, like parting the Red Sea or the burning bush or stuff like that. And yeah, hearing you talk about it makes me realize that Romance of the Three Kingdoms kind of fills that space in a big way. I don't know if you agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Like I said, I mean, it's, you know, the stories that culture tells about itself. And um, like you said, how these biblical stories are used to kind of teach about morality and values. I think uh, you see some of the stories from the Three Kingdoms and other, you know, classic Chinese works, you know, being used in similar ways. For instance, you know, the relationship between, you know, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei through the main characters, you know, that's often, you know, pointed to as the ideal friendship, fraternal bond, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go through several sayings here. I think I have four. Yeah, we have four queued up. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about a little bit about the opening line. This is something that you mentioned in the email. And that opening line is, 天下大事, 分久必合, 合久必分. What does this mean and why is this so famous? Sure. It means um, domains under heaven, long divided must unite and long united must divide. And I think it has become so famous, one, because the novel has become so famous, but also it really perfectly you know, captures the cyclical nature of history, right? And how nothing is permanent. And you know, it gets at the long dynastic cycles, division, reuniting, and then repeat the perfect preface for what happens because what follows is thousands upon thousands of pages of divisions and unitings and and all various different permutations of that so from here on we're going to jump into some of the everyday phrases that you might hear but before we do that i know that some people this podcast isn't going to be very long but some people don't have patience so people might tune out before we get to the outro so do you want to just sort of say right now if someone is hooked on this idea and they want to listen to the romance of the three kingdoms podcast where can they go to do that sure the best place to go to is uh the website chinese lore.com that's l-o-r-e and that's a website where you will find information about both the Three Kingdoms podcast and the current podcast I'm doing uh, on the Water Margin novel. Ooh. So ChineseLore.com, L-O-R-E. Excellent. I haven't started listening to the Water Margin yet, but I've also read that one in English, and oh boy, are the same problems there. It's very hard to follow opinion names. All right, so let's jump into these phrases. I'll list them all out first, and then we'll go through them one by one. There's 说曹操, 曹操就到, which I use a lot. There's 望梅止可, there's le bu si shu, and then there's one that I literally learned the week before I started talking with you on email, which is zhou yu da huang gai, yi ge yuan da, yi ge yuan ai, and that sounds long, but it's actually pretty easy to understand. So let's jump into these. The first one is shuo cao cao, cao cao zhou dao. What is that? Sure. So Cao Cao is uh, one of the major warlords during the Three Kingdoms era, and he is kind of the, the main villain in Ooh. the novel. Uh, and, you know, he's really become, you know, kind of the, you know, quintessential villain in Chinese culture. Uh, you yeah. Know, uh, kind of like the Darth Vader, you know. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, and the ironic thing is, you know, he built basically the strongest of the three kingdoms. Uh, you know, he was the prime minister of the Han dynasty at the time, which was dying. Um, and he basically ruled through a puppet emperor and his son later ended up, uh, you know, dissolving the Han and usurping the throne. Um, so Cao Cao kind of has you know, gone down in history as the villain, you know, the, the treasonous um, you know, minister who usurped his lord's throne. But you know, he was also, you know, in history, he was also a great statesman and commander. And one of the trademarks, uh, one of his trademarks in war was how quickly he mobilized his forces. And um, if, I'm, if I understand correctly, the, there's a specific story from which um, that saying arose is that at one point before Cao Cao became prime minister, you know, he was just one of many warlords out in the provinces and the emperor was being bullied around by two other warlords who were <laughs> in control of the court at the time. Mm-hmm. So later the emperor managed to escape from those warlords, but they were chasing him. So while the emperor was on the run, one of his courtiers said, hey, you should summon this guy Cao Cao to come and help you. You know, he's got a nice army and, you know, we think he'll be you know, a loyal servant. Um, mm-hmm. But before the emperor could even send out that summon, the warlords who were chasing him had caught up to him and things were looking dire. But just then, Cao Cao's forces arrived 
without even being summoned, and they saved the emperor. So what happened was Cao Cao had gotten wind that, oh, the emperor is on the run, um, and you know he, he's in danger. And Cao Cao decided that if I go save the emperor, that will really help me politically. And mm-hmm. so he sent his forces there. So it w- worked out just the way he envisioned it, you know, that really elevated his status and put him in control of the emperor. Mm-hmm. And so because the courtier has said, hey, you should summon Cao Cao. And before they even had a chance to summon him, he was there. So mm-hmm. hence the saying. Yeah. And that saying, I'll break it down. It's Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Jiu Dao. So Shuo Cao Cao is say Cao Cao or say Cao Cao's name. And then Cao Cao Jiu Dao, Cao Cao Jiu then Dao arrives. So say Cao Cao's name and he's already there. So how would we use, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Because Cao Cao is sort of a boogeyman of a villain, but in this case, he was acting like the good guy. So Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Zhou Dao, how do we use this? It's not really, I mean, whether he's a villain or a hero doesn't really factor into the way this is used. Um, Mm. It's just like, let's say, you know, if I was um, talking up to a friend say, hey, you know, I was just um, on a podcast with this guy, Josh, and Mm. right then you call me, right? I was like, then that might be a case where I go, Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Zhou Dao. Nice. The first time I heard this, I was in a in an office and someone mentioned, it's like, oh, we should run this by our boss, Jennifer. And then Jennifer walked in and someone said, ah, Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Zhou Dao. That's right. That's the exact right usage. Excellent. So that's basically speak of the devil, Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Zhou Dao. Now, maybe I should have done this earlier. We don't really have time to jump into all of the characters, but if Cao Cao is the bad guy, who are the good guys? Who are these other two kingdoms that make the three kingdoms? Sure. The good guys, according to the novel, is um, a faction led by a general called Liu Bei. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Liu Bei uh, was supposedly a descendant of the royal house of the Han dynasty. Uh, mm-hmm. He was on like some small little branch of the royal family <laughs> that's, you know, fallen on hard times. You know, he, he was a guy who got bounced around a lot and then finally hit it big uh, in the southwestern part of China and founded his own kingdom there. And the novel kind of holds him up as the uh, ideal Confucian ruler. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's just portrayed as very humane, very compassionate, uh, generous, honest. Uh, and most importantly, uh, being an ideal Confucian ruler, he was a man who recognized talent and, you know, deferred to talented men and, you know, deferred to his, you know, great advisor. So there's Liu Bei. And then the other kingdom is the kingdom of Wu, uh, mm-hmm. which is in the southeast. And that's led by the Sun family, uh, who were um, just another prominent family, you know, at the time. Right. So the Han Dynasty falls apart and it sort of for a while congeals into three kingdoms, one of them being led by Cao Cao, one of them being led by Liu Bei, who's the good guy, and one of them led by the Sun family, who neither good nor bad, just kind of there, very complex. Yet the Sun family is just kind of there. Um, They, you know, obviously there's tensions between all three kingdoms and they kind of go through cycles of being allies or enemies or frenemies, uh, you know, (laughs) depending on the situation. But really the main conflict uh, that the novel spends the most time on is between Cao Cao's kingdom and Liu Bei's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then every now and then, like, they will go and say, hey, let's go see what's happening in the Southeast. (laughs) And, you know, they devote yeah. like maybe like a chapter and then they'll go back to the main show. Yeah. Speaking of going back to the main show, our second expression, Wang Mei Zhi Ke, is also something that Cao Cao said, right? Yes. Uh, Wang Mei Zhi Ke means um, looking at um, plums to quench your thirst. And the story behind this was that uh, Cao Cao, um, you know, who has a reputation for being either very smart or very shrewd, depending on, you know, if you think it's good or bad. But he was on campaign one day, um, and his army was marching through some really dry, arid terrain, and all the men were suffering from thirst. There was no water around. The men were kind of just, you know, lagging behind. People were falling over from thirst. And thinking quickly, Cao Cao pointed off into the distance and said, hey, look, there's a big forest of plum trees up ahead, and we can quench our thirst with the plums. And, you know, like Chinese plums are kind of tart, right? So the thought of these tart plums made the men's mouth water, 
and suddenly they weren't thirsty anymore just because of the thought of the plums. And they even picked up the pace as they marched toward the supposed plum forest. Um, it, it, this, this is never addressed in the story, but I assume they found water somewhere up ahead because I would imagine the men would be pretty uh, pissed off if they march all that way and there was not actually a plum forest. So yeah, you said Wang Mei Zhi Ke. The way you translated it is specifically the four characters. Wang is to look at, possibly in the distance. Mei is a plum. Zhi is to stop. And Ke is thirst or thirsty. So Wang Mei Zhi Ke, look at a plum to end your thirst. I'm assuming that marching armies through deserts uh, with no water is not something that happens a lot in the modern world. So what sort of situations is this good for today? Well, so this phrase is generally used to refer to a situation where you're consoling yourself or somebody else by um, thinking about an unattainable fantasy, basically. Hmm. Um, so let's say like right now, you know, like right now, um, I haven't gone anywhere for like three, four months because of COVID. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's like I'm sitting around thinking, ah, you know, if I think about hiking through the, uh, I don't know, the green hills of Ireland. Right. Mm. That would be a case where, you know, one might say, um, uh, you know, Wang Mei Zhi Ke. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm also taking a Chinese class online. So my, I don't forget my Chinese because I'm temporarily not in China. And this came up in an article, and the article was talking about bosses who try to control their low-level employees by giving them promises of a raise. Like, oh, don't quit. I'm going to give you a raise next year. Or, oh, I'm going to put you on an important project next year. Or, I care about your development. And other companies, even if they pay you more, they're not going to care about you. They're not going to give you the opportunities I'm going to give you. But, of course, clearly they never intend to do that. There is no plum forest in the distance. And the article used the, used the word wang mei zhi ke to express this sort of tactic. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, there's a whole, actually a whole college industry of like Chinese uh, uh, business strategy books based on <laughs> stories or strategies from the three kingdoms. And I think you know, this, this sounds like an entry from one of those. <laughs> so much of the romance of the three kingdoms is about conflict. And so, so many of the expressions focus on strategy, technique, and how to dupe people or when you should act and when you shouldn't act, et cetera, et cetera. Speaking of which, our next phrase is le bu si shu. What, is, what is le bu si shu? Le means uh, pleasure or joy. Bu, mm -hmm. no. Um, si is to think of. And shu is the uh, name of one of the three kingdoms uh, from this era, uh, specifically the kingdom that was founded in the southwest of China by mm -hmm. Liu Bei, the good guy you know, of yeah. the novel. So together it means um, not thinking about shu because of pleasure. So the story behind it, and this is, it's a, uh, it's kind of a put down, it's a criticism. Uh, so the story behind it is that, you know, so Liu Bei founded this kingdom, the Southwest, but then after he died, uh, his son, Liu Shan, became emperor of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And unlike his father, this Liu Shan was a good for nothing, a terrible <laughs> ruler, you know, not only incapable, but, you know, he only cared about pleasure. And, you know, so he all, you know, he was, He's like the typical like corrupt, you know, Chinese emperor who hung around with eunuchs and you know um, hangers yes. on. Um, yeah, <laughs> and then uh, so in the end, um, his kingdom of Shu was conquered by the rival kingdom of Wei, uh, mm. which is the kingdom that Cao Cao's descendants were ruling. Mm. Um, and so in the year, I think it was like 263. And so when his kingdom fell, Liu Shan surrendered. And the kingdom of Wei accepted his surrender, but they weren't going to just leave him in his kingdom, in his old territory where, you know, he has a chance to plot rebellion. Mm -hmm. So they moved him to the Wei capital, which is a long way from home. Mm -hmm. And so one day while he was in the capital, the Wei prime minister invited Liu Shan and some of his entourage to a banquet. And at this banquet, they arranged for some entertainment that included a dance performance. So the dancing started off, they, you know, they, they start doing traditional dances of the Kingdom of Wei. But then midway through, they switched to doing traditional dances from the Kingdom of Shu. Mm. Um, and all of Liu Shan's entourage were former Shu officials. So they, when they saw their native dance you know, being performed by foreigners in a foreign land, that brought them all to tears because you know, it reminded them of everything they had lost. 
But Liu Shan himself alone was smiling, laughing, having a good old time, you know, just enjoying himself, um, completely oblivious. So at one point, the Wei prime minister asked him, so do you miss the land of Shu? And Liu Shan replied like without even hesitating, oh, no, it's fun here, so I don't miss it. Huh. Um, yeah, and so that made the Wei prime minister, even the Wei prime minister sighed and said like, you know, God, this guy's so unfeeling, you know, no <laughs> wonder his you know, kingdom fell. Who could have possibly helped him hang on to his kingdom? So yeah. later on, a little bit later in the banquet, Liu Shan was going to the bathroom and one of his former officials followed him and said, hey, you know, if you tell the prime minister that you missed your homeland, maybe he will send you back there, you know? So later in the banquet, the prime minister asked him again, so do you miss Xu? And this time, Liu Shan started you know, pretending to weep and say, oh, God, yes, I miss it so much, you know, <laughs> trying to squeeze out a few fake tears and couldn't really. <laughs> but the prime minister apparently had like heard like his uh, little exchange uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. So the prime minister laughed and said, so did that guy over there tell you to say that? <laughs> Liu Shan was like, oh, yes, he did. How did you know? <laughs> so all his, all his entourage were you know, just humiliated, you know. Mm -hmm. And the Wei minister had a good laugh. And the funny thing is that it actually kind of worked out for Liu Shan because this showed the prime minister that uh, this guy is basically not a threat. You know, mm. it, he, he is worried about pleasure. You know, he's not, he's not the type to think about, you know, staging a rebellion. So mm. he didn't really worry about Liu Shan anymore. But mm. that's the story from which we got the phrase, Le Bu Si Shu. And it's used to describe somebody who is so you know, enraptured by pleasure, so focused on indulging themselves that they forget mm. about their roots. Hmm. Do you have any good situations where we might use Le Bu Si Shu in the modern world? Yeah, I think, of, I think about like, you know, situations where it's, let's say like, I don't know, a hypothetical situation where a country boy goes into the city mm. and uh, just becomes so caught up in the city lifestyle, you know, that he forgets his roots, right? He loses mm. that, that part of himself, right? Ooh, I just thought about the Lion King when Simba goes and does Hakuna Matata with uh, Timon and Pumbaa. And then he spends a long time ing, but eventually he's forced That's to right. go back and, and, and solve it. There we go. Romance of the Three Kingdoms meets the Lion King, match made in heaven. It was the same story all along and nobody knew. They should do a musical about that. <laughs> I'd go in three years when we can finally go to musicals again. All right, so that's Le Bu Si Shu. And now let's move on to the last one, which is the longest one, but don't worry, you usually don't have to say the whole thing. It's Zhou Yu Da Huang Gai, Yi Ge Yuan Da, Yi Ge Yuan Ai. What is that? Sure. So uh, Zhou Yu and Huang Gai are both names of uh, generals mm. from the kingdom of Wu, which is the kingdom in the southeast that mm. was led by the Sun family. The word Da means to beat. So Zhou Yu Da Huang Gai, Zhou Yu beats Huang Gai. Um Yi Ge Yuan Da, Yi Ge Yuan Ai. Uh one is willing to beat or to hit, and the other is willing to take it, basically. Hmm. Sounds kinky. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so this is a famous story from the Battle of Red Cliff, uh, and which is the most legendary battle from the Three Kingdoms era because it pretty much set the stage for there to be three kingdoms instead of one. Mm. Uh, the background of this is that Cao Cao, by this time, had already united the north under his control, and now he was marching south to try to conquer the rest of the empire. So the two other factions, the Sun family and Liu Bei, uh, had joined forces temporarily to oppose him. Mm -hmm. Cao Cao was looking like unstoppable. He was a juggernaut <laughs> and he had a huge army that outnumbered his enemies, something like, I don't know, 10 to 1. Hmm. And the two sides were camped out on opposite banks of the Yangtze River. And Cao Cao was on the north bank and the coalition opposing him was on the south bank. Now, Cao Cao's troops were not used to naval battles. So he linked his ships together with big iron chains so that they would be more stable on the water. And that gave the uh, commander of the coalition forces on the other side of the river, an idea. So this commander was Zhou Yu, and he had come up with the idea that I can, you know, use fire to attack Cao Cao's ships. And because they're all chained together, they can't just, you know, all sail away from the one ship that's on fire. They will quickly burn. 
Um, but the problem is that he had to get close enough to Cao Cao's ships to start the fire. And that was going to be hard to do when you know, Cao Cao can see you coming from a mile away on the river. Uh, so one of Zhou Yu's generals, uh, Huang Gai, who was an old veteran, volunteered to go pretend to be a defector so that when he takes his troops across the river, Cao Cao would think that they were just coming to surrender and that would give them a chance to get close enough where they would start the fire. Mm. Uh, now, but Cao Cao was a smart guy, right? He wasn't going to <laughs> fall for the fake defector trick so easily. Mm-hmm. So Zhou Yu and Huang Gai had to sell it. And they mm-hmm. knew that Cao Cao must have spies in their camp by now. So the two of them devised a scheme to put on a good show. Uh, Huang Gai would pretend to publicly challenge Zhou Yu's authority over something. I think mm-hmm. it was like about Zhou Yu gave an order to, to everybody to, you know, prepare enough supplies to hold out for three months. And Huang Gai was like, three months? If we don't fight them within three days, we might as well all surrender or something. Mm-hmm. Classic Huang guy. <laughs> and Zhou Yu would pretend to be, you know, pissed off and like, how dare you challenge my authority? And mm. then he will order his men to beat Huang Gai and really beat him, not like pretend beat. Um, oh. And so that would create a believable uh, motive for Huang Gai to defect. And the mm. idea is that Cao Cao's spies in the camp would see this and bring that intel back to Cao Cao. Uh, and mm-hmm. so that he would have reason to believe it when Huang Gai, you know, sends him a secret letter, says, hey, I'm defecting. And so they carried out that plan and Huang Gai, you know, took his king name willingly. And I mean, it was a real king name, you know, at the point where he's like bleeding all over, you know, he couldn't move. But mm-hmm. it worked. Cao Cao was tricked and Huang Gai managed to lead some ships across the river and, you know, pretend that they were defecting. And then they got close enough and they started a fire and Cao Cao's navy went up in flames. Mm-hmm. And that turned the tide of battle. And um, the northern armies were crushed. And so Cao Cao really couldn't just steamroll the south. And that set the stage for there to be three kingdoms instead of one. Yeah. And I think Romance of the Three Kingdoms is full of instances where these larger-than-life heroes have opportunities to single-handedly change the course of history. And that's one reason why so many lessons come out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Because in you know, actual history, you know, the thing that did the most to defeat Cao Cao in this battle was famine. Oh, not famine, <laughs> sorry, uh, pestilence. Pestilence. Um, you know, his, his troops weren't used to the climate in the south, and they all huh. got sick. And huh. then... They, you know, their, his ship, some of his ships also got burned, but yeah. the pestilence did a lot of work. But, you know, the novel obviously leaves the pestilence out and focuses on, yeah, like you say, these larger than life heroes and stories and plots. Yeah. Pestilence doesn't make good TV. Fake beatings. No. Great. High ratings. Pestilence is just too slow. <laughs> it's not enough human interest there. So how would we use this Zhou Yu Da Huang Gai? Yigo Yuan Da, Yigo Yuan Ai. First of all, will we say the whole thing? Because I don't, I don't think I've heard anyone say the whole thing together. Yeah, usually people just say Zhou Yu Da Huang Gai, and mm. the second part is pretty much assumed. Yeah, kind of like speak of the devil. We all know, what, or like win in Rome or something like that. We all know what the second half is supposed to be. Exactly. So what sort of situation could we use this in? Uh, so it's usually used to refer to a situation where you have two parties and one party seems to kind of suffer at the hands of another party or get the short end of the deal or something. Right. Mm -hmm. But in reality, both of them are willing participants in this. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also used to kind of describe a situation where, you know, like this seeming imbalance or, you know, is is kind of just an act put on for appearance. Yeah. I'm thinking about like uh, if there's some scandal in a big company and the CEO gets fired, but he's also given a golden parachute. It's like, oh, we've chastised you. We've publicly beaten you. We don't like you. Here's a billion dollars. Go buy an island or something like that. Right. And in a case where maybe the CEO goes to like to his you know boss and goes like, you know what? Make me the fall guy, you know? And, mm. and then, you know, behind the scenes, he gets the golden parachute, gets, you know, whatever, you know, giant package of compensation, you know, to kind of step gracefully out of the scene yeah so any situation where one person or company appears to be victimizing someone else but it's really just it's all just a big plan right exactly 
All right. So those are our phrases. And we only talked about four phrases today. But I mean, when we were talking about this on email, I gave a couple suggestions and you came back with a list of like 10 or 15. There's so many expressions that come from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, but we don't have that much time. So let's review. And actually, I'm going to quiz you on these to see how good you're not. I mean, you say you're the expert. You don't say you're the expert. I say that you say you're the expert on Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And so now let's see how far that really goes. For example, if I want to describe someone who is leading on his or her underlings with empty promises for the future, then this is... Wang Mei Ji Ke. Oh, perfect. All right. I'll have to try something harder then. Uh, for example, if I say someone's name and then they just appear as if by magic, what's that? Uh, that would be Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Jiu Dao. Ah, this is getting really hard to stump you about this. Okay, what if I go off somewhere else and I'm just having so much fun there that I forget about my responsibilities back home or I sort of lose my original culture? What is that called? That would be somebody who is uh, Le Bu Si Shu. Hmm. Judges? Can we or Hakuna Matata. Okay, yes. We would have accepted Le Bu Si Shu or Hakuna Matata, so you got them both. So that's three correct answers, one more correct answer, and you will win something, one supposes. So if two parties are having a fake fight where one appears to be beating the other one, but the other one is actually in on it, what's that called? That would be a case of Zhou Yu Da Huang Gai, Yi Ge Yuan Da, Yi Ge Yuan Nai. You've done it. John Zhu, you have Yay! done the sweepstakes. You've answered all of our four questions correctly. And your prize today. What is the confetti? <laughs> uh, hold on. There's got to be a Zoom effect for that, right? Is there like a Zoom <laughs> background for parades and confetti? I'll figure it out for next time. And your prize for this is another slot to promote Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast. So remind people where they can go if they want more of this John Jew storytelling. Sure. So you can find the Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast and the Water Margin podcast, uh, mm -hmm. both on ChineseLore.com. And that's spelled L-O-R-E. www.ChineseLore.com. All one word, I assume. That is correct. Nice. Well, thank you so much, John, for taking time to talk to me today. Yeah, thank you, Josh. It was a pleasure. That's all the MSG we have for you today. If you want more, just follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, just search for Mandarin Slang Guide or at our WeChat, which is MSG Podcast, all one word, MSG Podcast, and you can join our WeChat group. Thanks again to John Ju for talking with me, even though he's much busier than I am. And a very special thank you this week goes out to Cao Cao. <laughs> You called? Oh my gosh, Cao Cao, I said your name and you really appeared! That's what I do, apparently. Well, hey, while you're here, you want to do an episode of MSG? No time. Gotta go look at some plums. Uh, uh, okay. Bye. Well, that was weird. But anyway, last but not least, thank you to you, the listener, for listening. I love it when you listen to this podcast. New episode coming in two weeks, so keep in touch. And 再见, 再会。再聊，拜拜。